All right. I am going to kick off our next segment, which is going to be led by Jennifer McLaughlin and Todd Jansen called Pre-Sales Organizational Design. I'm really excited for this one. I've gotten to know Todd through Pre-Sales Collective fairly well, and at Salesforce, Jennifer has an amazing reputation. So I'm really excited for this, this one today. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Todd and Jennifer. Show is yours. All right. Thank you, James. Uh, Jennifer, do we have you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, I can. Yep. There you go. Okay. That's half the battle. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today on pre-sales organizational design. Uh, so my name is Jennifer McLaughlin. I lead our retail and consumer bid solutions organization at Salesforce. Um, Todd, I think you have one of the coolest titles uh, at all of Salesforce. There's a global in your title, and there's also the term Q branch. I know that comes from the James Bond movie series, but can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. So yeah, uh, Todd Jansen, I run Q branch at Salesforce, and as you alluded. Um, yeah, it really did stem, stem from James Bond, but the, but the good thing is, is that, that Q branch is actually a real thing in real life. And so Q is actually short for quartermaster. And in the Army, the quartermaster arms the troops. And in the Navy, the quartermaster navigates the ship. And it is just a perfect metaphor for what my team does within sales. Right, we're not on the front lines closing the big deals. We're mostly behind the scenes helping our account teams, um, you know, put their best foot forward. And so you can think of QBranch as a digital agency within sales. We're building rapid prototypes and demos, uh, presentations, you name it. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later, but um, I appreciate the, uh, the intro there, and uh, we can get right into it. Awesome. So some of you might recognize this slide if you're familiar with Salesforce. It is our Salesforce Customer 360. Uh, this is essentially our integrated CRM platform that provides a 360-degree view of all of your customers. Essentially, this circle represents all of the different domains that we can help a customer transform. Now, if you're counting and you're counting quickly, you'll notice that there are 12 little icons around that circle, not to mention that there are other functional capabilities to the right-hand side, things like AI, data, and other capabilities that our SEs need to be able to speak to. So how do we actually set up a solutions organization so that we can have our SEs show up with a consistent message in front of our customer, as well as armed with the deep expertise to talk to any one of these different domains or functionalities? Um, we'll get to that. So this is a little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, it wasn't always this confusing. I think it actually helps to understand where we started from so that you can understand where we're going. So this is actually meant to look like a retro slide. This is a slide from 2008, and it's an homage to the fact that when we started the company in 1999, we only had one product. It was Sales Cloud, and it offered the promise of um, having your sales reps use CRM as easy as it was to buy a book on Amazon. Uh, the interesting thing about when we were only supporting one product is that we actually made some really critical decisions at the foundation that set us up for success going forward to now be able to represent all of those product lines you saw on the previous slide. So, Todd, um, you started at Salesforce in 2006, is that correct? Uh, yeah, through right at the end of 2005, yeah. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like in those early days being an SE and what your job and role responsibilities were? <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, um, you know, reflecting back on it, um, it was never, it looks really simple, right? It feels really simple. Mm -hmm. We had one cloud to sell, we were selling CRM, uh, and I was reflecting on it this morning, selling sales cloud was, was relatively easy, right? Functionally, it, it, it was only so deep, and, and you know, most, most sales people understand leads and opportunities and, and that stuff. But 16 years ago, we were selling the cloud. And that was actually really the hardest part of our sale was on-premise versus cloud, and cloud was so new. And so I was just reflecting this morning, in fact, so many of the questions were like, where are your data centers? Do you have an offline version? What happens if the internet goes down? Um, can I have this on my Palm Pilot? 
can I have this on my BlackBerry? And hopefully I'm taking some people back to those devices. Um, but that felt like the hard part of the job. The sales cloud bit was really, really easy and kind of mastery of that was super easy. Um, and I think what's really interesting, and I, I hope this slide starts to overwhelm people because it overwhelmed me when I was building it. You know, there's, there's folks on this, this uh, line who, um, you know, maybe your company has a single product and maybe you're about to go into a second product or maybe there's an acquisition on the horizon or you just acquired someone or maybe things are really starting to explode and there's multiple acquisitions and multiple products being developed, right? So kind of no matter where you are in that journey, kind of this one's for you. And so if you kind of go back to the, the 2006 marker there, <clears throat> it was mostly sales cloud. And uh, shortly after that, it was service cloud. And then we decided to um, really invest in the platform. And um, when that platform came about, we released a coding language called Apex. And that was a way to really make and then tweak Salesforce to do whatever you wanted. And it was right about that time that I started to get really frustrated as a solution engineer because I was not a great developer. And so I found myself being really frustrated going back to my desk and trying to hack through code and not spending time with customers. And keep in mind, like we had three releases a year. So, you know, it was really hard to become a developer and then also stay on top of the technology and on top of acquisitions and all that stuff. And that's kind of what this slide is laying out is, you know, over the last 21 years, you know, we're doing three releases a year for our core products, more releases a year for some of our other products, and all the acquisitions along the way. And so really what I'm getting at is at some point, you can't expect your SEs to do everything, right? It just becomes impossible. And so back there in around 2008, uh, I had this idea. I said, look, there should be a small team that just codes. And we as SEs could go to that team and they could help us out with the code. We grab it from, we show it to the customer, and, and we're, on, we're on our way. And that was the genesis of QBranch. And again, you know, you can think of QBranch as a shared pooled service. Um, and so the reason I wanted to tee that up and spend some time on that is at some point in your journey, you're going to have to think about, wow, our SEs can't do it all, right? As Jeff just said, like you have to be the product experts, but maybe you don't have to be the coding experts. And so, you know, I wanted to plant that seed early in our discussion today that you will have to cross this at some point. And so I want to get you thinking about what are some of those early skills you can remove from your SE's plate and maybe pull into a shared service. And, you know, just to give you an example of what some of those skills might look like. So th this is very kind of particular to Salesforce, so I know it'll be different for everyone. Um, and usually how I explain this slide is like, look, if we could make the Uber SE, if we could go into the laboratory and just make the, the, the perfect SE, they'd have that core SE DNA. Uh, but if we go below that, below that dark blue line, you know, we'd expect them to be developers, be great at webinars, be great at UI UX design. They would devour RPs. They'd be great with deal strategy. Uh, in all their spare time, they'd build scalable demos and share that with all their peers. Um, they'd make demo prep tools, right? They'd make data loaders, so it was one click to load perfect data for your demos. They'd be um, experts in value. They'd be great with video, and they could take um, some of those awful PowerPoints that we see some of our colleagues present to executives, and we could, we could touch those up and make them look amazing. Um, so this is just an example of some skills that aren't necessarily tied to go to market. You know, as Jeff was just saying, as you go around the globe, you know, you need people that are either versed in a, in a language, a spoken language, or understand the regional nuances of that region and selling to that region. Okay, this is very different. You know, what are some of these just skills that aren't, aren't related to go to market that we might be able to take them off their plate? And just to kind of round this out, you know, this is essentially what I've done with QBranch over the last 13 years, is I've taken a lot of those skills that SEs don't necessarily need to be experts at, but still need to, to be able to access, and I've taken them off the plate. And so just kind of to sum up the last 13 years of my journey, that's essentially what I've been doing. And hopefully this is starting to get the wheels turning for some of you on the line of, you know, maybe where some of those areas are. Yeah, great. Thanks, Todd. I'll, I'll also tell you an anecdote um, that I shared with Todd when we were preparing for this presentation. Uh, I was an SE at PeopleSoft in 2004. 2003 maybe, and I had the opportunity to interview at Salesforce. And when I went through that interview at Salesforce, 
I thought that the job wasn't the right fit for me because it was much too technical. They were asking my technical acumen and my ability to code, and that was just, I was much more of a functional SE than a technical SE, so uh, unfortunately it wasn't the right fit at the time. Now looking back, uh, I, I wish it would have been or I would have given it a, a little bit more of a try. But um, anyway, if we go into this next slide, um, so now that we understand a little bit about the shared services organization that Todd's put together, let's discuss how we're organized in the front of the house. So when I say the front of the house, I'm talking about those SE teams that are responsible for aiding in account planning with the AEs, they're conducting deep discovery with the customers, and they're demoing to the customer. So this is like the traditional SE role that we know and love. Um, there are a couple of things that are inevitable in life, right? There's death, there's taxes, and the other one is that there is a yearly go-to-market shuffle amongst the sales force sales teams and how they're going to organize in going to market. So when I first joined Salesforce nine years ago, we were really focused on industry. Um, and the pendulum is always swinging at Salesforce. So we were focused on industry, at that point in time, we had a financial services team and a financial services practice, as well as some other industries. Um, then if you fast forward to two or three years later, we conducted this whole new look at how we were going to market. And we really looked at our global cities and what the TAMs were for our global cities. I live outside of New York, so I was part of the New York um, Total Addressable Market, what TAM stands for. Uh, and New York was ranked the highest. So New York got a lot of additional resources and we actually had one sales team and one solutions team that focused on financial services, media, communications, as well as high tech. So I remember on one particular team, the Verizon SE, the GE SE, and the Citibank SE were all on the same team. Now, again, the pendulum is swinging back and we're much more focused on industry. Um, so Todd, if you'll go to the next slide, I'll just describe a little bit of what our current state is. So now we're actually doing, like I said, a little bit of both. We're focused on industry to a degree, um, as well as we're focused on either regions, countries, or product lines. Um, we're aligned in something called an operating unit. So what this is at an atomic level is an OU contains all of our account executives, our solution engineers, our value services teams, enterprise architects, and BDRs. Um, it was actually patterned on um, what they were doing in Japan, and they were just achieving great success just having this one kind of elemental unit. So that's the way we're currently organized across the company. Um, in terms of this operating unit. So in the next couple of slides before, I'll turn this over to Todd, but in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about some considerations to think about as you're organizing those teams that are really across the top of the gray line. And Todd, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about the shared services organization below the gray line. And again, some of the deal, deal side and scale side things that you're bringing to the table. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is, you know, depending on where the team is in the world, this is gonna vary. Right, so in the US, we all speak English. And so we can, we can primarily align by industry. But over in Europe, if you have different spoken languages, that's where you have to align first. And you have to understand the regional nuances and then maybe industry second. So it's gonna vary depending on where you go into the world. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, there's someone out there probably saying, can you guys just give me the answer? What is the right <laughs> answer? And Jennifer, you and I were talking about this yesterday. So this, is Jet, this executive at Salesforce, amazing executive, his name's Tony Rodoni. And I guarantee you there's people on the phone that know Tony because Tony's like the Kevin Bacon of, of software. Like he knows everybody. Six degrees of separation for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was really frustrated one year and I said, Tony, like, what's the right answer? And he's, you know, he just had this great advice. He's a sage. He said, you know, Todd, I was in this role one year and one year we'd be aligned to tech and product. The next year, marketing. The next year, tech and product. The next year, marketing. And he said, there's pros and cons to both. You know, when we were aligned to tech and product, we were true to the core, building great product. When we were aligned with marketing, we were closer to sales and we were involved in more deals. And so I think one of the takeaways here is there is no right or wrong answer. Um, and if you're Salesforce, we just switch it every year to like, see if we can figure out what the answer is. Um, 
But to go below the line here, um, just to give you a sense of some of the buckets that I think of when it comes to a shared service and things that don't necessarily need to be in region or it, uh, in some of these operating units. Um, so obviously I have a group of developers, I have creatives, I have an advisory team. I'll talk a little bit more, more about that later in demos. And that's really kind of, that's really what I call the deal side. So I have a whole group of people that are just focused on deals, right? They are taking requests on active opportunities and trying to get things out the door as fast as possible. The other side of QBranch is scale. And that's the repeatable demos, that's demo prep tools, and the knowledge and enablement that goes with it. And so for anyone that's thinking about starting a shared service or has one, I think you'd all agree with me, I love that scale bucket. I think you start there. You can put one or two people there and make a huge impact on all your global SEs. And so I think the Great. best way to, to tee this one up, Jennifer, is if we, if we click down into one of those OU um, rectangles, kind of what does the next level of granularity look like? Yeah, sure. So um, pools versus aligned, and I think that that's a, a really poignant commentary that, that Tony Rodoni um, had, had offered, right? Um, pools versus aligned. Well, I run a little bit of both in, in my teams. I have around 200 people in my organization, and so I have a bunch of different types of solutions teams um, that all roll in through me. And they're aligned, some are aligned in a pooled basis, and some are, some are actually aligned resources aligned to a specific account or a specific AE RVP. So in, if, if I talk a little bit about what are some of the considerations for each of these, when we think about aligned, and I'll just give you an example of some of my teams which are aligned versus pooled. Aligned are those SEs that are um, owning the, the, the customer narrative, right? They might be ones that are working deeply with strategic accounts. These were also our, our walk the halls at these in pre-COVID times, right? They're really aligned to the customer's objectives and um, really, sorry, my dog was about to come in, <laughs> really aligned to the customer's objectives and what they're trying to strategically accomplish within the year utilizing Salesforce products. Now, when we talk about our pooled resources, some of the considerations can be either complexity of, um, of the, the kind of the sales motion or actually the deeper expertise. So if I look at a couple of my teams which are pooled, my specialist teams which have deep domain expertise in areas like application development or customer service, those folks are pooled. Um, as I mentioned, I run a national team and so these folks are also geographically dispersed. Um, so pooled for the deeper expertise. And then I also have, on the contrary, if you look at some of the, the teams that align to my small to medium business segments, these are customers that are under 2,000 employees. Those folks are also run within a pooled format. Um, again, that's usually a quicker sales cycle. And so sometimes just availability of an SE is what's needed. Now, again, some of the considerations to think about when you're deciding between a pool or a line are geography. We talked about that in terms of my specialist teams really being geographically dispersed. Um, complexity of sales motion. So if it's a simpler complexity of sales motion, like within the small to medium business space, it might lend itself to more of a pooled aspect. Um, continuity is really important. So when I'm thinking about aligned resources, you know, I want the same SE to meet with Coke day in and day out, right? And that same kind of aligned ecosystem of teams. And then finally, you have to think about your ability to execute on a pooled model. And so by that, I mean, like, what is the request process? What are the thresholds for an opportunity to actually assign an SE? And then who's actually managing that queue? So you have to be able to have a manager who has a good sense of what his team and their skill sets and their availability is so that they're assigning the right resource to the right opportunity. Yeah. Well said. Anything um, to add, Todd? <laughs> Before we go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and, and so here's the thing, and, and here's a little bit um, where I think, you know, I'm, I have to be very aware of all the changes that happen every year, especially with your organization, Jennifer, um, but it doesn't necessarily change how my team operates. And I think, you know, if I could, you know, kind of put a pin in that, you know, the, the takeaway for this presentation is one advantage a shared service has is as the world changes every year at Salesforce, 
you know, my team continues to serve the SEs on the front lines, right? There's very little disruption in my team, right? We're still here, we're still shared, anyone can access us. And so I think when it comes to disruption, um, you know, that's what I love about my job is like, you know, we're, we're constant. SEs don't have to worry about who's gonna help them out with their code or their presentation for their, their next demo, we're just there. Um, last thing I'll say here is, even though we are a giant global pooled resource, we are starting to align more to those operating units. So at the top there, you'll see advisory strategy and industry SMEs. Um, it really does start to make sense to have people in my organization aligned to the operating units. One, so like Jennifer, you have a single point of contact who you can go to on my team. Right. And that person acts as a wayfinder, right? And they can help enlighten your organization on all the, the things that we offer, because that's all, often a challenge too. What does QBranch do? You, do? you guys do that? Um, but so, so that's kind of a shift we made over the last year. And um, I think it's really important that we start to align more there. And that's that when I say sure. we, we, me, we need to align more there. Yeah. And, you know, just, just some more commentary on that. The ability for, you know, Todd, for example, to have a couple of point people that are aligned to specifically my team, um, they can also go deeper in those areas that my retail and consumer goods customers care about. So retail and consumer goods customers, you know, we've seen a huge surge in commerce recently and in, in the selling of our e-commerce platform. Um, a lot of that is because, you know, stores aren't open, right? So there's a lot more traffic going through our e-commerce system. So if, if somebody on Todd's team is really aware of that trend, um, then they're also helping us address that trend with, um, you know, some of the demos that they can provide and some of the scale that they can provide. So it's not the complete Wild West when we talk about pooled models as well. Um, there's there's something that I, I like to say is kind of like a light flavor of alignment that's in all cases considered we're going to go to this resource, for example, within my customer support team, but I have the ability to pull in, to pull in others, again, based upon availability or deeper domain expertise and certain specializations. Yeah, I was seeing a question here, uh, Richard Rose, good to, good to see your name on here. Um, just about, you know, how as companies get bigger, like storytelling becomes a big a big part of the SE job. And um, it, it's a bit nuanced here, but I think it's an important point, right? When, I, when I'm when i aligning someone to your organization, Jen, like they do need yeah. to have retail and consumer goods um, experience and, and build that knowledge. But I think what's really key is, and the little triangle here is supposed to represent that, they come up with killer story with your team, they need to very quickly then swivel chair to some of these resources to build the demo assets. And so I think, you know, that's, that's why I've kind of shaped this the way I have is um, time is of the essence in pre-sales, right? And so, you know, that alignment to your org yeah. and then alignment to the people that can, can, can build um, has to be very fast. Yeah, for sure. All right, so one of the other considerations is generalist versus specialist. So I mentioned that my specialist SEs, those are the, you know, the, the customer service SEs, the application development SEs. Um, I would even term our enterprise architects as specialists. Um, but I'm also talking, if you can abstract just a layer away from that, just a, a typical SE, I think you have to determine when you're looking to hire, are you looking for a generalist or are you looking for a, a, somebody deeper that is a specialist, even if they sit with on the same team. So when I'm talking about a generalist, as you think about these really mature accounts, so an account like Coca-Cola has been a Salesforce customer since I believe 2010, I might have that date wrong, but they spend, um, a hefty amount of money within Salesforce, and they're very penetrated on a lot of our different product lines. So it makes sense for the SE that aligns to Coca-Cola to be able to speak to that entire, and this is a Salesforce term, C360 narrative. So that was the original slide that you saw. Um, it makes sense for the generalist on that account to be able to um, navigate the account, really quarterback anything that needs to be done for that particular account and pull in the right domain expertise on the back end. So some of these really mature accounts like a Coke, a Pepsi, a Target, a Walmart, I would actually be looking to hire more of a, 
a well-rounded SE that can tell that story across varying different product lines and just can also speak to varying different business owners um, within that customer. Now, if we look at on the other side of the house, a specialist, the way I like to term specialists is that they are both lifelong learners and lifelong teachers. They have an intense need to go very deep into a subject, and they also have a need to enable their other team members. So we're, we also ask our specialist SEs to enable, um, you know, the broader SE org on topics. So as we're either um, organically creating new products or acquiring new products, we typically look to our specialist organization to get everybody smarter on those on those domain pieces. So if you go to the next slide, great. And this is, we're, we're coming near the end, so we would welcome any questions, but, you know, I think, and, and when you think about a balanced solutions team, I think that's something you really have to ask yourself. So knowing all of those considerations, knowing that, you know, Todd's team is actually taking this complexity around um, being so technically adept, um, he's taking that out of the hands of the frontline teams. So I think you really have to ask yourself, do you have a balanced solution team? And by this, I don't visibly mean what you can see in terms of a diverse solutions team, but I'm actually also talking about diversity of thought. Um, a couple of years ago, we were doing a hiring surge, and I remember my boss at that point in time said, you know what? and this is not to offend anybody who is an Oracle SE, but he said, you know what? We have touched all of the Oracle SEs that are open to coming here, that want to come here. We have to find new sources of, of places for our candidates. And, and really, he was, A, he was right, um, but B, if you have a solutions team that is made up of seven people that all look the same, that all came from the exact same company, that's not a balanced solutions team. So what we've really started to do in the past years is to look at different areas of hiring too. Um, you know, we're looking at industry experts. Um, you know, I, for example, like I said, run a, a consumer goods and a retail team. I have somebody, I have an SE, and she's actually one of the best SEs I have on my team that used to sell luxury handbags. So she came from industry, she was really well versed in retail. Um, and is now doing her thing as an SE. Um, you know, some other places to look for um, potential hires or customers, right? Customers that have either used um, Salesforce at that customer or, you know, maybe they just have line of business knowledge. That's really powerful to couple with some of the deeper expertise on your team. And then also looking at partners. And, and so this is a, an offer for a different kind of methodology instead of just hiring potential SEs from your competitors. So Todd, I know that this is also really important for you and for your team. Um, how do you feel about a balanced solutions team? Yeah, it's huge. And I'll give you some examples. And so, you know, 13 years ago, we, we started QBranch and we took that coding requirement away from SEs. Um, you know, it opened up it opened up the aperture for who we could bring as a, in a, a solution engineer. And so, one great example of that is SDRs and BDRs. When all of a sudden you didn't need to code, we had a, a great migration of SDRs and BDRs, which have become some of the top SEs in the company, and, and frankly, some of the top SE leaders in the company. So that's been awesome to see. Um, I think another example, you know, going back to the diversity of thought. Right. Some people think they see the diversity word and they start thinking about all the check boxes that they got to check and, you know, the shape of their team. And, and, you know, you, you nailed it. It is diversity of thought. And I'll give you an example. It's a bit embarrassing. Thankfully, it happened a long time ago. Um, but we were working with a really large media company, a really large media company that's hard to do business with. You could probably figure out who that is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we had, we had a big opportunity in front of us. So, um, Someone assembled, quote unquote, you know, the, the, the best and the brightest to come up with with a solution. So we were all there in a room for a couple of days. There was 13 of us, and uh, it was around helping a mom plan a birthday for their child. And so we thought we had something super hot, and we were really excited about it. And um, I wasn't in the room, but this is the feedback we got. So they sat down with the stakeholder, 
and uh, they did the presentation. They said, well, what do you think? And she goes, um, I think it sounds like 13 guys got in a room and came up with this story. And she was totally right. And so, um, <laughs> you know, look, again, it's, it's just one example, but, you know, what we are really missing in that room was diversity of thought, right? And to get diversity of thought, we needed a diversity of people, and we clearly didn't have that. And so I think th these are examples, and, and really the point here is, um, you know, Jen, as you specialize and you pool resources in your org, you open up that door to non-traditional hires. When, when I take some of those requirements off your team's um, requirements, that opens up even more, a greater ability to bring in non-traditional hires. And I'll, I'll leave you guys with one example. I just brought someone to my organization who had been in hospitality her whole career. She'd worked the front desk of a, a hotel for a very long time. And here's what I've learned. If you can work the front desk of a hotel, I can put you in front of any executive and I can put you in front of any salesperson in the world because you've seen it all. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that last anecdote out there. For sure. Yeah, so um, in summary, um, what you've heard today is is a couple of different things. Um, we've, we've tried to give you an example of how we think about organizational alignment for a solutions engineering team at Salesforce. Um, I think one of the big nuggets is early on, uh, Todd and his team, uh, he was able to set up a shared services organization. And that just having that as the foundation has really just opened up all kinds of possibilities for us in some of the field teams to organize the way that we see best for the customers, for our geography, and for our different product lines. Um, we also talked about some of the considerations to think about when you're thinking about how to organize those field teams. So some things like, do you go pooled versus aligned? Um, do you hire generalists versus specialists? And then really looking and asking a hard question about the complexion of your SE teams and making sure that you're providing diversity of thought as well as that, you know, deep product expertise to the table. Well said. And I think I, we're ready for questions, right? I, yeah. I, I think we're ready for questions too. Thank you, Todd and Jennifer. Super impactful. We actually have some really nice conversations happening inside the chat and in the Q&A during that session. But I want to take it back to the hospitality item and talk about non-traditional hires. Todd, I actually took your comments to heart because I work at a front desk and ran a VIP program, so I'm <laughs> glad to hear that you've been hiring that profile. Um, I think the idea of non-traditional sources continues to be on top of mind for pre-sales professionals. Jennifer, you mentioned it best, like talking to someone who sold handbags, right, and be able to put them into the SC world. Can you guys maybe expand any bit further on where some other sources of success around non-traditional hires have been, and then potentially, like, what have you and your teams had to do to make sure that they learn, you know, the Salesforce product set to be our, to be able to articulate value effectively? Yeah, sure. So, so I'll I'll start, and then I'll I'll flip it over to you, Todd. So, um, you know, another great source of non-traditional hires are teachers. Um, teachers, whether they come from the software space and they're trainers uh, within other companies, or honestly, whether they're teachers. That same boss that I mentioned during the presentation used to be a math teacher, and he was a math teacher for, I think, seven or eight years before he moved into the world of software. Um, that really shows a love of teaching, a love of learning, and a curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, so teachers are other great sources. Um, you know, I, I'll also say as I, as I think about some of the other industries that we have at Salesforce, as we go deeper and deeper into industry products, you really have to start thinking about, you know, taking people from those spaces. So we have a health mm -hmm. cloud now. Do you think about hiring people from the healthcare space that don't have any software experience? Because they can actually provide that, mm -hmm. you know, walk in my shoes about what it's like to use the product. In financial services, I know my peer over there is actually hiring people, again, that don't have Salesforce experience, but that can speak to wealth management because that's mm -hmm. such a critical need and a product set. So I think you can look at, especially as you're getting into these deeper industries, you can look at, you know, what you really need to speak to. Um, I'll also say that that my uh, one of my pet peeves working at 
Salesforce. <laughs> um, so this is trusted amongst friends, right, or amongst my 200 <laughs> friends, is that sometimes we just put our Salesforce lens on speaking to a customer. And I really like to bring that industry knowledge with my team that is agnostic of Salesforce as well. And I think when you can hire those industry experts, that look through fresh eyes at the problem that our customers are facing, that also really brings a balanced perspective. Um, and then I'll also say that once you hire those people, A, you have to make sure that they are innately curious, that they, you know, want to understand how things work so that they'll have a desire to dig into the software and at least understand how they can put their spin on it. And then you also have to have a great mentor and a great onboarding process to make sure that you're filling in the gaps for what what they don't have. No, that's great, Jennifer. Todd, what are your I, I'm thoughts? in manufacturing. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Todd. Oh. Yeah. yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, because you, you absolutely nailed it, um, on top of what you just said, is curiosity, right? I think we'd all agree, like, deep curiosity is the core DNA of a great SE. And, and so, Jennifer, what you already described is kind of involved in that. Um, you know, deep curiosity, lifelong learner, beginner's mindset, like there's your DNA, right? You can shape shape anyone with that. Yeah, yeah. no, that's great. Sure. And Jennifer, to your, to your point, I'm in manufacturing at Salesforce, and some of our best employees are people that came from business ops and business strategy within manufacturing companies. They just know how to resonate with our customers yeah. um, better than some of our other teams. So I love that you guys brought that up. Todd, maybe this question will be started at you first and then to Jennifer. Since you guys have both been at Salesforce for quite some time, um, Nas asked the question around when you introduce um, this type of shared services org, how does it change maybe the hiring profile or the scope of what your SBs should and could be doing, right? Because if you, you bring in your type of team, that does offload some of potentially what was required of them previously. And so for many orgs or that might not be as mature as Salesforce, like wh what is that shift? Like what's that point that you need to be able to understand like, hey, we're gonna bring in this model and it's going to be a multiplier effect for our current people in the current role. I love this question because um, this is so important. There is a very, very big difference between staff augmentation and skill augmentation. And some people might be thinking of the shared service as a way to do staff augmentation. Hey, we're gonna hire a, a bunch of young, cheaper people somewhere in the world to help build demos. Essentially do the same job as our SEs, we just need more of it. Um, and I guarantee you, you will build more demos. I don't know if that's what gets a deal closed or if that's the right thing. And so I would really challenge you just to think about it from a, a skill augmentation standpoint, right? What are SEs maybe not great at? Um, has your product changed and all of a sudden they're having to learn something new that's really gonna be a challenge? So what skills do you wanna bring in? So I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, I have developers, right? They come in every morning, they wanna develop. And so they can write code in 10 minutes where it might take an SE four hours. And that's not an exaggeration. I watch the same thing with my graphic designers. I've watched one of my uh, folks in, in Photoshop touch up a, a photo and an image in five minutes, I would have had to gone through Photoshop tutorials, I would have had to install it, I had to get IT approval. Mm -hmm. It would have taken me two days. And so skill augmentation is the answer there. Yeah, I, I'll also add to that. Um, you know, Todd and I are also very involved in a, in a group at Salesforce called WISE, which is Women in Solution Engineering. And, um, about four or five years ago when we started the group, um, one of our challenges was to look at recruiting profiles and actually to look at something as, as simple as the wording in the recruiting profiles and the skills we were looking for and the degrees, like the acceptable degrees that we had listed within the hiring profiles. And what we found there is that, you know, it was really limiting some of the diversity that we had coming through the door if you're just looking for computer science um, majors, right? I actually had a chemistry major. So I would have been, you know, I would have avoided applying based upon what they had within the, the recruiting profile. So I think also, and I'll get around to this, what I'm saying is, is if, if we can even reduce some of those skills and some of those needs by setting up a shared services group, then we actually have the ability to look for all those roles that I talked about in the previous question. 
Um, so it's, yeah. it's really been helpful and eye-opening, honestly. Yeah, I love that perspective, and thank you both for that. I want to ask one more question around justification, and then I want to talk about some things uh, potentially next year. Um, Toby asked a question around, you know, justifying the value of a shared services team, right? So for companies that are a little bit smaller or don't have this model, how are either of you, you know, justifying these types of resources upward? <laughs> it's a good question because it's a constant battle. Um, and, uh, you know, as companies get big, you know, where the heads sit and the politics always apply. But in general, I would say this. Um, and I'll use this example. I know it's not relevant for everyone. But um, let's say a big part of your current SE's job is coding. Go to your, your sales VP and, um, and uh, put a sticky note on their, their desk or on the screen and say, you know, I'm really proud. Our SE's spent 6,000 hours this year coding. Not in front of customers, at their desk, just hack and code. And see what kind of response you get. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm being humorous about it, but that's kind of, and that is the justification, right? We all know that if SEs are in front of customers, customers are happier, deals get bigger, close rates go up. And so that should be the goal. And so the justification is, can we help them do more of that? Um, and so in that package, it's that simple. Here's the other thing that I always coach people on, and it's not this simple. When you start a shared services team, go to finance and try to get a two-to-one ratio, meaning, hey, the cost of some people in the shared service, we could get two of them for the price of, let's say, an SE, because some companies just a heads, a heads, a head. And what I found is, like, you can take some more junior people in their career. You can hire people in other parts of the world for a much cheaper rate to do the coding than you can an SE. And so if you set that up early, you know, you take this like, oh, do we hire an SE or the shared services person? If it's two to one, you're going to do yourself a huge favor. Perfect. Yep. Jennifer, anything to add um, I mean, I think he encapsulated it pretty well. The, the only other thing that I, that I think about, and I'm actually trying to push more of it into Todd's team, is repeatability. You know, like as we, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, there's the coding and the helping with the custom demos, but then there's also, you know, my team is big enough now that somebody in California um, might be doing this, the same type of demo as somebody in New York and they might not be talking together. So if we can have a, um, a consistent demo org or demo environment that mm -hmm. bakes that consistency mm -hmm. within into the process, again, that frees up my SE's time to meet with the customer. And honestly, customer facing time is the metric that, that I look at. I look at customer facing time. Yeah. I look at, I look at hours to code and I, like hours that they're spent customizing the demo. And whenever I see that that hours of demo customization is out of whack, that's when I try to say, okay, does Todd need more headcount? <laughs> because my SEs <laughs> yeah. are spending too much yeah. time customizing demos instead of in front of customers. So it's, it's great that you're looking at data like that. And I, I think it's a good transition. So as you mentioned, you're pushing for Todd to get a little bit more resources, but are there any major adjustments or, or minor adjustments that you're looking to make for your, your model for next year? Yeah, you know, and I, I kind of alluded to this going into, or at least during one of the slides in the presentation. Um, I'm looking at what can I do for my really mature customers. So I've got a handful of probably five to 10 customers across my team. These are folks like Home Depot, Lowe's, Pepsi, Coke, Procter & Gamble, Walmart, Target, like the behemoth within my industry. Um, it requires, as I indicated in the presentation, a generalist type of SD. But I'm also looking at, you know, sometimes in Salesforce we look at things in like yearly spurts. How much, and, and that's the way our sales teams look at it, like how much ACV will I be able to accomplish this year? I think we have to take a long game look with our SEs, especially because we want consistency with that. And so I'm trying to look at more of a, 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 a length of time. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't have it all developed yet, but really looking at what kind of SEs 
are right for this type of role because it's also, if you think about how mature these customers are, they already have a lot of their product. Are they utilizing a lot of our product? That is another key metric that we need to make sure that our SEs are emphasizing. So it is kind of a blend of a pre-sales role as well as a post-sales role. And that takes a generalist type of SE, but also a little bit of a different type of SE. So I'm looking at possibly implementing and adding a couple of those types of SEs to my organization to, to, um, to really align to those more mature accounts. Well, that's great, Jennifer. Todd, um, and I really appreciate that perspective. So Todd, let me ask you a question here. Is, like, is there anything else that you'd like to be doing with two brands that you're not doing today? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I did see a question earlier about what does the ratios kind of look like, and I'll just quickly answer that. In the beginning, we were about 20 to 1, so for every 20 SEs, there was one of us. Um, and I'd say at this point in our history, we're probably closer to 30 to 1. And frankly, that's, that's because we focus on scale a lot, so we're constantly trying to put ourselves out of a job. But our product has also gotten better. So, like, 13 years ago, you needed a lot of code to make Salesforce really customized. Now, it's mostly clicks. And so, um, there's been a good evolution there. Um, I think, you know, my big focus, and Jen just hit on it, right? She mentioned some really big customer names. Um, you know, I'm trying to uh, shift from this, this kind of on-demand world where any SE anywhere in the world can log a request and we fulfill it, right? Kind of like, you know, you log a ticket and it gets fulfilled. You know, oh, I need some code. We write it. We give it back to you. And really start to prioritize some of the bigger deals and the bigger uh, bets within the company and really drive alignment there. So that's that's where I'm headed, and, and, and frankly, it just makes good business sense, right? It just, it's just, this is about dollars and cents, and so that's a little bit of our evolution. That's our journey, and, um, and frankly, just really excited about that. Oh, yeah. I, I like that. Maybe one question for, for both of you just quickly because we're almost out of time. In terms of comp, right, I've seen a couple questions here on comp, right? Like, what, what is the appropriate way to compensate your teams? And are you two aligning on how Todd's team should be comp versus Jennifer's team? Or is it a completely separate item? And do you get into, uh, you know, potential tips a, a, around that? I'll, I'll start with that because, Jennifer, your answer is going to be more, more challenging because there's um, yeah. nothing more complicated than SE comp. We'll throw that out there. Um, sure. I made a decision. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, constantly. Yeah, I made a decision many years ago to not have my team comp like SEs. So we are on the, the compensation plan that most of Salesforce uses. There is some small bonus contingent, but it's not based on deals. And so by removing my team from that, I removed any judgment on, oh, should I work on this or not? It also allows someone in the U.S. to work on something from APAC or EMEA right? There's no territory. There's no like, oh, I don't get comped on that. So I removed that years ago, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and Jennifer, just... take us home. Sure, yeah. Um, I wish we could go home on a question other than Effie Comp, but hey, that's the hand that I would tell. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I will say that um, like GTM alignment, comp seems to be a moving target within Salesforce. Um, as we've grown to, um, you know, a really large organization now, um, we, we are still given some flexibility at my level, and that's what I like, right? So mm -hmm. my peer who is doing financial services, um, we have a little bit of um, control over how we want to comp the SEs in terms of the variable component, right? There's, of course, a, a component that is coming straight from the company's number, and then there's a variable component. And within that, we have the ability to determine even which teams within my org I want to comp differently. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this could get into a really long conversation, but um, we have something at Salesforce called a Z2 mom which is essentially, it stands for vision to value uh, metrics, obstacles, and measures. And, or I might have mixed the order of some of those, but it is basically our yearly vision statement and how we're going to accomplish it. Um, what I'm encouraging my teams to do 
is to, they have some flexibility. Of course, they have to, you know, it has, I have to have oversight to it, but to really hold their teams accountable to their stated V2 mom. So that could be a series of MBOs that they're trying to deliver, but I think that mm -hmm. that just really keeps us connected to a purpose as opposed to connected to a number. Um, so I found that that works really well within the variable compensation component. Perfect. Well, I appreciate both of you guys giving your perspective. I know ending on comp is not the funnest subject. Mm -hmm. However, it's definitely a subject that we continue to talk about as a leadership collective. So Jennifer and Todd, thank you both very much for your time. This was a very interactive session and uh, looking forward to doing some sort of follow-up in the future. Thank you.